So petty bourgeois socialism. Let's take a look at that. So it's nice that they give this, you know, little rundown of all the different kinds of socialism that existed at the time that they wrote the, the Communist Manifesto. Uh, it helps us to get a better sense of where did communism come from? Because although they are criticizing all this, uh, even, you know, this clerical socialism and, and uh, feudal socialism, those ideas being current in society is what allows Marx and Engels to give their analysis that they do. Uh, they're really uh, leveraging these ideas that are that are out there. And we saw with Robert Owen, you know, he's he he fits into this this burgeoning socialism. And uh, we'll see at the end here that that they have some pretty sharp criticisms of him. OK, so Betty petty bourgeois socialism and here Petty means like petite, like small. So small bourgeois socialism, like small business people that, that like are owner operators of small business, shopkeepers, uh, regular merchants, things like that are, are petty bourgeoisie. Okay, the feudal aristocracy was not the only class that was ruined by the bourgeoisie. Not only the, not only, not the only class whose conditions of existence uh, pined and perished in the atmosphere of modern bourgeois society. The medieval burgesses, uh, the burghers as I was calling them, and the small peasant proprietors, uh, those yeoman farmers, were the precursors of the modern bourgeoisie. In those countries which are but little developed, industrial and commercially, these two classes still vegetate side by side with the rising bourgeoisie. In countries where modern civilization has become fully developed, here we have the idea of development that we saw in Gutierrez, and Dussel is very interested in the idea of uh, development as well. In countries where modern civilization has become uh, fully developed, a new class of petty bourgeois has been formed, fluctuating between proletariat and bourgeoisie, and ever renewing itself as a supplementary part of bourgeois society. The individual members of this class, however, are being constantly hurled down into the proletariat by the action of competition. And as modern industry develops, they even see the moment approaching when they will completely disappear as an independent section of modern society to be replaced in manufacturers, agriculture, and commerce by overlookers, bailiffs, and shopmen. Uh, and, and we do see this develop, uh, especially in the 20th century. So in the, in the 19th century, uh, and, and let's just think in the United States, maybe we can picture that a little bit better. But in the 19th century in, in Manhattan, so like in the biggest city in the country, the most industrial, you know, modern city, you still had like a lot of uh, uh, bagel shops and and bakers and shoemakers and shoe repair and and all these sorts of things. You had tailors, and all of these shops were run. Uh, at least most of them were run by petty bourgeoisie. These are people who own the business. They're owners, so that makes them bourgeois in some respect. They're they're not just employees getting a. a a wage for their, you know, unskilled labor. Uh, they're actually owner and operators, and they actually have skill. They're actually skilled people. They know something that, you know, they have the knowledge, and, and that knowledge is necessary for the business to function. Um, and they may have several employees that then are proletariat wage slaves. Um, and, and, you know, let's say, you know, at the end of the 19th century, turning into the 20th century, we, we can just think uh, of a picture of Manhattan. And on every street there's, or every other street, there's, there's a tailor. On every other street there's a, there's a bagel shop, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you go in there, the owner's there, at least, you know, most of the time. And uh, you have, you know, your, your, local little uh, cafe where you, where you get a sandwich and a coffee and, and this kind of stuff. And, and you know the owner. He's a petty bourgeois. Okay. Uh, 
but we get to today and there's a Starbucks on every corner, not even every other street. There's literally a Starbucks on every corner. Uh, and nobody, uh, no, when you go into Starbucks, nobody owns the Starbucks. They're all wage slaves, right? And so this is, is exactly the kind of phenomenon that um, Marx and Engels are describing. Uh, before it actually totally developed, they could just see it happening. Uh, and so those, those people who own an independent coffee shop, they may have a good run for several years and, and they have a nice flourishing business, but sooner or later, Starbucks is gonna put two Starbucks on, on either corner surrounding this little independent coffee shop and soon, you know, uh, they price uh, the independent coffee shop owner out of business. And we've seen that over and over again. So just with the, the abundance of wealth and power that a Starbucks has as a transnational corporation that has now probably 10 times more locations in China than it does in the United States, um, they can use all of that revenue and you know, do competitive uh, predatory pricing, you know, advertising, special promotions, all the kinds of stuff that, that um, have successfully driven out uh, independent coffee shops. Okay, and sorry to focus on coffee, sh coffee shops. I used, to, I used to go to independent coffee shops quite a bit. Uh, that's where I got all my, my homework done. Um, okay, so in countries like France, where the peasants constitute far more than half of the population, it was natural that writers who sided with the proletariat against the bourgeoisie should use in their criticism of the bourgeois regime the standard of the peasant and petty bourgeois. And from the standpoint of these intermediate classes, so like a middle class, should take up the cudgels for the working class. Thus arose petty bourgeois socialism. Uh, Seismundi was the head of this school not only in France but also in England. Okay, so he's another author that that uh, like Owen wrote a lot and tried to promote a, a kind of socialism, um, but it is a kind of uh, 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 reactionary um, form of socialism because it's trying to retain the special privileges of this middle class within the larger bourgeois class structure. This school of socialism dissected with great acuteness the contradictions in the conditions of modern production. Okay, so they say with great acuteness, like these are people that we read. Uh, uh, Sismondi, we read Sismondi, yes, there's some good analysis there, but overall there's a problem. It laid bare the hypocritical apologies of, of economists. It provided, uh, it proved incontrovertibly the disastrous effects of machinery and division of labor, the concentration of capital and land in a few hands, overproduction and crises. It pointed out the inevitable ruin of the petty bourgeois and peasant, the misery of the proletariat, the anarchy in production, the crying inequalities in the distribution of wealth, the industrial war of extermination between nations, uh, the dissolution of old moral bonds, of the old family relations, of the old nationalities. Okay, uh, they even foresee industrial war of extermination, which really didn't come to fruition, the, the full extent of that until World War I, uh, as Scheidler does a good job at, at pointing out. Uh, but then of course we have Hiroshima. Uh, okay, that's another scale, but um, but I don't think that Marx and Engels could have ever conceived of that. In its positive aims, however, this form of socialism aspires either to restoring the old means of production and of exchange, and with them the old property relations and the old society, or to cramping the modern means of production and of exchange within the framework of the old property relations that have been and were bound to be exploded by those means. In either case, it is both reactionary and utopian. And there we have that word, utopian. Um, 
And what they're saying here is that, uh, and we had this experience very recently in the United States where there was a lot of people uh, starting their own business, making crafts that they maybe made at home or, or they opened up a shop and they, they did handwork, handcrafted things, even like handcrafted beers. You know, there was a lot of businesses in that. Uh, but, you know, when an economic crisis happens like COVID, uh, most of these businesses uh, go under. And, um, and to mention coffee again in Long Beach, you know, my favorite coffee is this place called Lord Windsor. They would roast their own beans. And it just, it was like phenomenally better than, than anything else you could get anywhere else. I would just buy the beans and, and roast it and, and, and make my coffee at home. But the, the quality of the roasting, this handcrafted roasting was so superior, it's, it's like uh, incredible, um, which is great. But, but when COVID hit, that business went out of business and they couldn't survive. Starbucks is still around. Okay, you see my, my caffeine obsession. Okay. Um, its last words are corporate guilds for manufacture, patriarchal relations in agriculture. All right, so they want a guild structure like the medieval guilds in the workshop, in the factory, and have somehow maintain guilds within the factory uh, and the same old patron, peasant, you know, patriarchal relationships in agriculture, uh, you know, where the patron is is buddy buddy and, and meets face to face with all the workers and they look up to him as a leader and, you know, there's all these, this kind of tribalism, <clears throat> um, you know, this is petty bourgeois sort of mentality. Now, corporate guilds, uh, for manufacture still exist in Germany to, to a large extent. So there are these, these uh, strains still continuing to this day, which, which undercuts um, the sort of black and white dichotomy that Marx and Engels are, are drawing. Also, um, until recently, uh, there were many places in Latin America, and this is, you know, particularly particularly relevant to thinking about Dussel in the Latin American experience, and we've done some historical background. Um, I haven't been able to develop this quite as much, but when I, when I do classes where I get deeper into Romero, um, you know, I talk about this, but like in El Salvador, up until uh, about the 1970s, there was still patriarchal patron and campesino um, social structure out in the countryside where the campesinos were exploited, uh, but they weren't just like kicked off the land randomly or, um, you know, it wasn't, it was bad, but <laughs> somehow it wasn't as bad as the real industrial scale of production that, that, is, that has taken place in more recent decades um, where, you know, you have babies that are dying of starvation while they're parents are out in the fields uh, working, you know, for minuscule wages that they can't even uh, keep their babies alive and things like that. There was much more social cohesion in the early part of the 20th century. And that's, you know, a hundred years after uh, Marx and Engels were writing this. So this long durée picture of history is important. And I think Marx and Engels lost sight of that uh, in writing the Communist Manifesto, but you know maybe they did that on purpose because it is a piece of propaganda. It's trying to get people motivated. It's trying to mobilize the proletariat. Let's do this now. Let's not wait. Um, all right. Ultimately, when stubborn historical facts had dispersed all intoxicating effects of self-deception, this form of socialism ended in a miserable fit of the blues. Okay, doomed to failure is their, their analysis. 